The following podcast is offered freely through the Insight Meditation Community of Washington and by Jonathan Faust. To learn more or to make a donation to support this work, please go to www.jonathanfaust.com. So there's this guy who is lying in a hospital bed, and both his legs are in traction and his arm is in traction. And, and sitting next to him is his partner, you know, who's sort of, you know, dabbing his brow. And, and he looks up, you know, with this incredible, you know, look in his eyes. And he says, you know, you're, you're always there for me. You know, you were there when I fell off the roof cleaning the gutters. You were there when my, when my business went bankrupt and I had to start over. You know, you were there when I had that, that horrible motorcycle accident. And I'm beginning to realize that you are bad luck. <laughs> it's an oldie but a goodie. As the saying goes, who's always there when things are going wrong? You know, you are. And this path, this life, is about the, the self-discovery of how we can become more free. That's the essence of it. Uh, the Buddha was stopped on the road and said, in his lifetime, he said, what, uh, what do you do? What do you teach? And he said, I teach only two things. I teach suffering and the end of suffering. So I'd like to sort of narrow the focus a little bit to specifically working with physical pain and how you can transform your relationship to pain. And, and how I'd like to do that. It's pretty ambitious, so I may have to just start talking faster and faster as we go along. Um, I'd like to review the, the Four Noble Truths and how they relate to pain. These are the four foundational insights of, of Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist psychology. And to talk a little bit about the, the classical reactions to pain and how you can become more aware of, of how it is you're relating to it, which is the key. And to explore an approach that can really help you change how you focus your attention. We, we tend to fixate on pain when we experience it, but there are other ways you can shift your attention that, that will, in time, shift your relationship to that phenomena of pain. And then to share a little bit of, on some of the essential strategies, you know, some other, other approaches, because there are numerous doorways to this inquiry. So we're going to be trying on techniques tonight. And um, if you don't have any pain, uh, Bob has volunteered. He has a hammer and a pair of pliers. And uh, just raise your hand. He'll come around and give you some sensations you can play with. But actually, when we, when we do these uh, practices, if you're not feeling anything painful, just focus on where you feel the most predominant sensations. Because it's really just about how you are with, with the, the direct experience of sensation. So if you can imagine that in your life, you don't want anything other than to know what is true, like to know the, the laws of reality, and to know who you are beyond sickness, old age, and death. And, and in that pursuit, you'll try any technique, you'll listen to any teacher, you'll try on any philosophy, and you give your whole life to experimenting deeply and evaluating as to what, what passes the, the test of your scrutiny. And that's, that's what the Buddha did in his life, whether it be the, you know, the life of, of the Buddha or whether the story of the Buddha is simply archetypal, of what it means to dismantle what is untrue to discover what is true. So in his whole lifetime, there were four insights that described the bedrock of, of the human experience. And basically they're suffering, the fact of suffering, 
the cause of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the path or practices or techniques that lead to the end of suffering. So I imagine each one of us has our own physical challenges right now. You know, what's the worst, what's the worst pain that you have registered in, in a body? It's an interesting question. And I was asking myself that because I was, had to write this talk. And I had dengue fever when I lived in, in West Africa, which is called break bone fever. And when you sort of come through the next day, it feels like someone has beaten your body with lead pipes. It's, that was a pretty strong, pretty strong experience. I get chronic migraines. Um, I had a motorcycle accident that like exposed some bone to open air. That was no fun. But then I remembered, actually it was on my way here, I remembered probably the most intense pain that I ever experienced. I must have been about 12 years old. And my brother, who was, must have been nine, we were in some kind of like a, sort of like a butt-kicking competition, you know, where someone's not looking, you kick them in the butt. And uh, a mature expression of our, of our boyhood. And somehow I let my guard down. And I, I remember I was in the living room, and we had sort of been roughhousing there, so I was picking up some cushions. So I was bending over to pick up these cushions with my, <laughs> my flank exposed. And so my brother came up. And if you can imagine, like, you're, you're a punter and you're in your own end zone and you've got to kick the ball, you know, out of the end zone, that's the force he came up to, uh, to kick me. And if it had landed in a different place, I would have enjoyed the joke and returned the favor, but he was aimed a little south. And uh, the sensation was like nothing I have ever experienced before. Kind of lights and stars and... Uh, and difficulty breathing. And, um, and I saw how deep my identification, my identification is with what's going down there. There's a, a fair bit of clinging. So we've all experienced sensation and pain. And when you can reflect on these Four Noble Truths, they apply. What I love about them, there's this great... Um, a Vietnamese monk who said that uh, the beauty of, of the teachings of the Four Noble Truths is that it is a philosophy that you can spend your entire life investigating. And it's so simple that a child can grasp it. The fact that suffering is part of the human experience. That when you come into form, suffering is part of this, this journey. And that if you examine the cause of that suffering, there is some form of identification. There is some form of attachment, some form of clinging. And the third insight is that it's possible to let go. It's possible to let go to that which you are holding on to. And we all know that because we've all done it before. If you let go a little, there's a little bit of inner freedom. You let go a lot, there's a lot of inner freedom. And the fourth insight, that there, that there are practices, there are teachings, there are techniques that lead to increasing the possibility of living without suffering. So in any given moment, when there's a, when there's a complaint, in any given moment, you can pause acknowledge the plain, the complaint is there. And in sense, what am I holding on to? What am I believing? That could be a really interesting inquiry. How is your body holding it? And then inquire, can I let this be? Can I let this go? Sometimes we can do that, sometimes we can't. So when you engage in this practice, you are you're training yourself to see what's true. To really see what is happening without embellishment or story. And then the second part of that inquiry is to explore how you are with that. 
the attitude in the mind. If you're grasping, if you're moving away, or if possibly you're holding it in some kind of presence, some kind of compassionate presence. So we all have our reactive patterns to pain. That when you start feeling unpleasant sensation begin to build and it becomes a storm, we are, we all have access to particular strategies to either ignore it or be with it or the agitation or reaction to it begins to become more and more overwhelming. So there is a story in sort of the you know, Buddhist mythology, if you will, of a very sick monk, an elderly sick monk, and he was on his deathbed. And his body was literally decaying as he was in it. And somehow he had a radiance and a brightness in his being. And he was, he was visited by a number of monks and they were so struck by like, this quality of presence that they asked him, what do you, what's your practice? What are you doing? And I've noticed having lived in ashrams for much of my life and being around practitioners, there's always this inquiry like, so what are you practicing? What's, what's working for you? Maybe I should try that. So this is what he said. And the language is a little stilted, but this is what he said. He said, I remain focused on the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. So he remained focused in and of the body itself, resting in the body, the mind ardent and alert, as bright and alert, and putting aside greed and distress with references to the world. So really what he's describing is a deep sense of absorption. Simply of being absorbed in the sensations without adding any story to it. Without adding any, any story of fear or control, just coming back to the senses themselves. That's a really challenging thing to do. Let's try this on, just as a little two-minute meditation. If you like, you can close your eyes. And I'd like to invite you to select a focal point. This could be the breath at the nostrils, or maybe just the sound vibrations, maybe this feeling in the fingers, palms, and hands. And let your attention focus on those sensations. And just notice if you can stay with the sensations without adding a story or commentary to it. And we'll just take a little while to practice. This is what the monk said. I remain focused on the body in and of itself. Ardent, alert, and mindful. And putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. And just noticing the quality of the mind, the imprint of that practice, any observations. Then if you like, you can let your eyes open or feel free to remain with them closed if you prefer. And that is a hardcore practice, to stay with the sensations without adding a story. 
But that's the essence of what we practice in Vipassana. When you wake up lost in the cognitive, you come back to the experience. And of course, when you feel pain, when you feel unpleasant sensation, the mind gets activated. So we begin to see how we react, but it's the very reaction that causes a chain of events that lead to the suffering in relationship to pain. Here's a little more of what the Buddha said. When touched with a feeling of pain, the uninstructed, run-of-the-mill person sorrows, grieves, and laments, becomes distraught. So he feels two pains, physical and mental. And just as if they were to shoot a man with an arrow, and right afterward were to shoot him with another arrow, he would feel the pain of two arrows. In that same way, when you are touched by a feeling of pain, and you become distraught, you feel two pains, physical and mental. So the challenge is, is when we feel sensation arise in pain, is it possible to experience it without adding a reactive pattern of some kind? There are five classical ways we react when things aren't going our way. Either your mind becomes filled with animosity, with aversion, with judgment, with anger, blame, irritation. And so we, go, we get lost in that cloud of mind state. Or you'll go off into disassociation through planning and fantasy. Just anything but what you're feeling. Or your mind will, will just explode with anxiety and with worry, where the mind is kind of restless and out of, out of control in relationship to that pain. Or you will seek to numb yourself, to invoke a, a sloth or a torpor, a way of disconnecting. And the fifth state is where you become paralyzed by doubt or by, by ruthless criticism. Recognizing how you are reacting to the pain can be very, very helpful. Because once you recognize the state, you've begun to disidentify from it. And the equation that's oftentimes used is P times R equals S. Pain times resistance equals suffering. You can have a hangnail and be really resisting. You're going to suffer a whole lot. And you can have a, a more serious experience of pain and not be resisting it, and your suffering will be much less. You may not have control over the pain, but what you do have control over is how you're holding it, how you hold that with attention, how you hold it in your heart. Of course, what happens is, when you feel pain, the mind fixates on the pain. We can't not do it. And the challenge is, is to not see what it's like to actually experience it. You know the story of someone who goes to the, to the dentist and the dentist says, well, I'm going to give you some Novocaine. He says, no, I'm going to meditate. He says, are you sure you want to do that? He goes, yeah, I want to transcend dental medication. That's really bad, sorry. <laughs> it was just in there, it had to come out. I, I would have gotten sick if I hadn't said that. So, so thank you. The mind fixates on pain, and it sort of ignores pleasure. So I'd like to share with you a technique uh, which I have shared before, but it is one of the most helpful techniques for me. I get chronic migraines, and uh, I've tried everything. I've been getting them since I was six. So I've tried all kinds of stuff. But every now and then, I get them, and I'm just, just on for the ride. And I've tried every technique there is, believe me. And uh, this is one of the more effective techniques I've found. 
This is also a, a technique that is often taught for those who, who have just experienced trauma and who are sort of overwhelmed by the somatic experience of fear and helplessness. Because it's very, very hard when you're feeling trauma to be, to be invited in to feel the senses because it's the last place you want to go. It can be overwhelming. And so oftentimes you're taught how to find a resource state somewhere in your body where you don't feel the sensations of fear. And for many people who under severe trauma, it, it might be the tip of the nose or the earlobes because there are actually fewer nerve endings there. And yet you have sort of access to it. And I've been amazed how many people I work with individually <clears throat> where I'll say, is there somewhere you don't feel it? And they'll, after a few moments, they'll say the tip of my nose. So part of the practice is you learn how to keep your attention there. And only when you feel sort of safe and grounded and resourced, you can begin to let your attention move to other sensations. And when it feels too much, you come back. So it's, a, it's called titration or pendulation, where you're sort of moving your awareness around the body. So in this practice, you'll be identifying the three main manifestations of energy <clears throat> or sensation. There is sensation which is unpleasant. We experience sensation which is pleasant. And then sensations which are neither pleasant nor unpleasant or we could call those neutral. So from unpleasant to pleasant to, to neutral sensations, we have unconscious reactions. <clears throat> Excuse me. If it's unpleasant, we want to strategize to make it go away. If it's pleasant, we'll strategize how to get more in never increasing quantities forever and ever. And if it's neutral, we get bored. We can't keep our attention on it because there's not enough happening to hold our attention. So in this meditation, I'll be inviting you, if you have somewhere that feels chronic, you can bring your attention there. Otherwise, focus on an area that just feels the most predominant. And you will identify the unpleasant sensation as zone one, and the pleasant and neutral sensations as zone two. Normally, when the mind is sort of untrained and doing what it does, it just keeps going to zone one because it's looking for danger, trying to solve the problem. And what you do in the practice is you actually keep your attention in zone two. So you guide your attention to the neutral and pleasant sensations. And, and you do this by letting your awareness move freely through your body. And then you can sort of add a, a naming or a noting of the sensation. So again, it's sort of like your awareness, sort of like a, just a moth moving around at random, and you'll name the sensation. So it might be elbow relaxed, a left wrist tingling, palm of the hand relaxing. When your attention goes to zone one, to the unpleasant sensation, just guide it back to zone two and just continue to, to sense. Now you may notice that zone one is going to change. Sometimes it changes. It'll sort of bleed into zone two. Sometimes your system will just sort of relax a little bit as you've shifted your attention. As Joseph Goldstein said, when you do this kind of practice, there are only three things, only three possible results. You're either going to feel better, you'll feel worse, or you'll feel the same. So. We'll just try this on and see what it's like. So when you're ready, you can close your eyes. And you might take a few slow and long, deep breaths. Relax on the out breath and soften the belly. And you might just sense through the body and just notice if there's a place where you might feel maybe some unpleasant sensation, maybe a little pain. And if there's nothing strong, just select the area that feels the most predominant, whatever that may be. And sense, if you can, the, the shape and the size of this, this felt sense, this sensation. 
you might even sense if there's a color that you can give it. If you can sense the volume, how much water could it hold? And just sense this sensation as zone one. And begin now to let your attention move, just sense through your body and just notice any areas that feel pleasant or neutral. And for the next minute or so, as you, as you notice a particular sensation, just name the location and the quality of feeling and then let your attention sort of spontaneously move and find another place. And we'll practice for, in silence for the next minute or so. If the mind goes to zone one, just escort it back. Let the attention flow freely through zone two, neutral and pleasant. You might notice if zone one has changed in any way, its shape or size or quality of feeling. This is just a minute or two of exploring the technique, but you may notice a shift. And you might like to explore another possibility, which is to bring that same attention into zone one, letting your attention move around inside zone one and just name, name a location, a quality of feeling, just for a, a little less than a minute. And if it feels like it's too much, then just go back to zone two. And you might now just release the technique and just notice the quality of feeling, quality of presence. Just notice anything that may have shifted in the last four or five minutes. And then if you'd like, you can let your eyes open or again, remain with them closed if you prefer. So did you get a sense of that? of that technique. Did, did you notice a shift in zone one? Did it shift at all after just a, like a minute or so? It's quite extraordinary. Now there are a couple things that I find about this technique, particularly when I'm on the edge of overwhelm and my migraines can get so strong that I get, they make me nauseous, you know. When there's sort of that sense of them so big, when I do this technique, inevitably I have this little moment, a little light bulb goes on and I'll realize 94% of my body feels okay. You know, there are actually parts of my body that actually feel pretty good. 6% of me is completely freaking out. But the 94 is not so bad. And, and there can be this sense of, I can be with this. I may not be able to fix it or make it go away, but, but I can be with it. And that's an enormous accomplishment because it's a shift from being in anxiety and fear and feeling your whole nervous system sort of shut down to more of a sense of equanimity. Like this is what it is and I, f I have found a way to hold this. It's the difference between being in pain and being in pain and a lot of suffering. <laughs> There's so much to, uh, so much juicy stuff on this topic. And uh, I'd like, and maybe I can share another, another technique. And to me, this is sort of a indicative of sort of the span of how you can direct your attention. You can think of, of awareness or attention as light. It's, it's just everywhere, you know, it animates. 
you can take light and run it through a magnifying glass and create a heat that's like a laser. You can, you can burn things just through concentrated light. And if you think of just being outside under the sun where the light is diffused, that's the same light, just wide open, all pervading light. So different techniques help you to direct that attention from laser-like to open to the space itself. And I'd just like to describe one technique, and you might want to play with it at some time, and then we'll, we'll experiment on the other end, the other end of the pendulum. There's a, a technique that, that some people call connecting the dots. That is when you feel strong sensation and, or pain, let's just call it pain, and you have enough concentration and presence of mind. Let the, let the sensation be the object of your meditation and notice how, how inside of it you can go. And sense if you can actually, and Joseph Goldstein calls, connect the dots. Notice where the pain jumps around and try to connect the dots between those, how, how intimately you can slice a second and notice where the sensation is. And when you can get very concentrated, you'll notice that the pain doesn't stay in one place. It's moving around. It's actually electrical. And sometimes that can be a very power first of all, it's a very powerful concentration meditation. But sometimes it can also facilitate a very powerful shift in the sensation. So you're actually moving into it is almost on a molecular level. It's fascinating. And you begin to see, of course, into impermanence, that the sensation isn't solid. And then you see into dukkha or suffering, how you're holding it. And it brings up some very interesting insights around who you are as the observer of the sensation. Are you the sensation or are you the observer? On the other end of the spectrum, we can actually train our attention to be more aware of the space that is holding sensation. And that can be pretty wild. So there are some really interesting techniques around feeling the space around the sensation and feeling how big that space is. And then bringing your attention inside the sensation itself and feeling the space inside the sensation. Again, it's a, it's a different way of reframing our experience that could be quite, quite interesting and, and quite helpful. So, um, if you like, let's try this one on. This will be a little five-minute meditation. So, again, when you're ready, you might just feel the breath. And take a few long and slow, deep breaths. Notice how you might relax or soften on the out-breath. And I'll be offering a series of questions around sensing space. And you'll have about 15 seconds to sort of investigate that. You're sort of directing your attention where the question takes you and just noticing any felt sense experience. And can you feel or imagine the space inside your thumbs? And can you feel or imagine the space inside your fingers? Can you feel or imagine the space inside your palms? Can you imagine or feel the space between your forehead and the back of your head?
And can you feel or imagine the space between your navel and your spine? Can you imagine this perception of space as effortless? Is it possible to feel or imagine the space inside the sinus cavities in your head as you breathe? Can you imagine or feel the space between your toes? And you might now bring your attention to where you feel some strong sensation, the most predominant sensation you can find, and, and just sense if you can feel the shape of that. Is it possible to feel or imagine the space between that sensation and the front of your body? And can you feel or imagine the space between that sensation and the back of your body? Can you feel or imagine the space around the sensation? And can you feel or imagine the space inside of the sensation? Is it possible to feel or imagine the space inside this sensation while simultaneously feeling or imagining the space inside this room? And can you imagine the space inside your body and the space outside your body as one continuous space? And gently deepening your breath, and just noticing your experience, what may have shifted, perhaps in relationship with wherever you feel the sensation the strongest. So when strong sensation arises and it becomes an object of investigation, it's very helpful fundamentally to to explore how you're holding the experience. If it's possible to hold your experience without adding a second arrow of an aggravated mind. It can be helpful to explore how to be with that. To notice the sensation and and sense the other qualities of sensation, the neutral, the pleasant, that can oftentimes shift your relationship with it. Sometimes you can bring your attention in a very narrow way to examine in great detail from this place of the witness or scientist. And sometimes it's helpful to open up your awareness, to, to feel the space, the infinite space that's holding and permeating that sensation, that could be helpful as well. Those are practices of awareness. But another way, an equally powerful, if not more powerful way, is through the lens of compassion. 
So why don't we close with just a short meditation with a little reflection on the heart practice. You might take a moment to just notice where you feel strong sensation or maybe just reflect on a recent experience of pain or maybe even to bring into mind someone who may be in some physical discomfort right now. And just take a moment to hold that in your mind, if it's helpful to create an image. And Thich Nhat Hanh offered these words as a way of reflecting on an experience like this. And it's simply to say, I care about this pain. Another way to hold your experience, particularly when you're in discomfort, is to remember other people feel this too. And to recognize that the pain that you experience is experienced by every other person on this journey in some form. And so in this practice, we open, to, we open to space, we open to awareness when we examine what's between us and feeling free. And we can also open to the infinite realm of compassion and kindness. So in these closing minutes, you might just deepen the breath and in your own way offer uh, a wish for yourself. And bring into mind others in your life that may be in some form of pain and to, to wish them well. I care about this pain. And when you're ready, you can deepen your breath. And when you're ready, you can let your eyes open. So thank you for your time, your kind attention. May you and your pain have a wonderful evening together, wherever you may go.